riche. Mais ma première question, Glenn Cook, c'est quand est-ce que vous avez commencé à, à lire Enfant, vous lisiez beaucoup Is this working? There it goes. Uh, yes, I started reading at a very early age. I uh, always and still do read a great, great, great deal. I have an iron rule in my life that I have to read 50 pages of something every day. Ah, c'est une bonne règle, <laughs> tout du moins. Quels sont les, les auteurs qui vous ont marqué à cet âge-là I started out reading what we call westerns in America by Luke Short, Louis L'Amour, and Zane Gray. Um, then I discovered science fiction and I read everything that was in the public library that was available as science fiction. I had a very good librarian who would find books for me from throughout the library system in order to feed my addiction just because she liked kids who actually read books. J'ai entendu parler de, de Jack Vance, Fritz Leiber, qui vous aurait particulièrement marqué. Uh, later, yes, when I discovered uh, fantasy, uh, Fritz Leiber was very important to me. Jack Vance has been one of my favorites ever since I discovered him. I uh, wish he would continue writing, but he's almost a hundred now and been blind for the last 30 years, so it's very difficult for him to write. <coughs> uh, of course, Tolkien. Everybody's read Tolkien. Um, I reread The uh, Lord of the Rings periodically. Um, many, many, many authors that I, I follow. I like the juvenile authors a great deal. Diana Lynn Jones and uh, Um, Tamara Pierce and, and several others whose books I read the instant that they come off the press. C'était déjà de la fantaisie, c'était déjà de la science-fiction. Qu'est-ce qui vous plaisait à ce moment-là C'était euh, l'évasion de, de nouveaux mondes à découvrir Yes, I think so. Uh, I'm not really sure what all the appeal was. Uh, it just I was very much reading history and, and as I say, the Westerns before I discovered science fiction and fantasy and continue still, but uh, once I discovered science fiction, it opened whole new realms of wonder, I suppose, and uh, it's been my main fiction reading all of my life. Quand est-ce que vous avez commencé à écrire en parallèle Comment c'est comment venu Vous avez toujours écrit ou il y a un moment où vous vous êtes dit « J'ai envie d'imiter un petit peu ces auteurs-là » I started trying to write stories when I was out of school, sick for a period of nearly a month, when I was 11 years old, I believe. I had all of the diseases in cereal that we now inoculate our children against. Everything you can imagine, including scarlet fever and whooping cough and the mumps. I had them all one right after the other. I started trying to write stories then and did write an American Civil War story called The Hawk, which was not really a story, it was just a vignette of an encounter between Confederate and Union troops from the viewpoint of a hawk that was circling overhead. And I wrote a science fiction story that had to do something with Ramses II of Egypt fighting the, either the Hyksos or the Hittites at the time. Is anybody translating for the folks out here? Or do they all Oui, il y a quelqu'un qui traduit pour le public. Oh, ok. Good, good. <laughs> good. Uh, I don't remember anything much else about that story except that it was involved flying saucers during 
of chariot battle. From then on, all through my high school years, I wrote stories for the school literary magazine. And then when I went into the Navy, I was much too busy to do any writing. Then the Navy sent me to college. And during college, I discovered that I could uh, take my way through a lot of classes by writing stories about whatever the thing I was supposed to do, a report or a paper on. If I just made up a good fiction story about it, I could get a much better grade than because for some reason the instructors were impressed with the fact that I, I would go to that effort uh, when it was actually a whole lot easier for me. <laughs> then uh, I went to work for General Motors and had no time to write until I had it, until I was installed in a job where we were working out at an ammunition plant during the Vietnam War and we were there seven days a week, 11 and a half hours a day, no days off for almost three years. Good money, but the job they assigned me to consisted of sitting and waiting for the phone to ring, which it might do three times a week. And I would answer the deal with the problem. And the rest of the time I was sitting there reading books because I had nothing else to do and I got to the point where I was reading books that were so bad that I said you know I know I can do better than this and since I had my own typewriter and comfy paper and everything else there to work with I said why don't I do it on their time I did it took me about three years to sell something that was a lot harder than I thought it was and I sold a couple of short pieces, and I sold a couple of short novels. And then for nine more years, I couldn't give away anything. But I kept writing all that time. And then during the 1980s, everything that I wrote during the 1970s, all sold in a rapid amount of time. It looked like I was writing about a book a month rather than what I was actually doing. On, on, juste, on va revenir sur, sur ses débuts. Euh, je crois que le, les tout débuts de, de, de vos débuts d'écrivain professionnel datent de 1970. Comment ça s'est fait Vous avez rencontré des éditeurs, vous leur envoyez des manuscrits, vous les avez tannés pour euh, être publiés. Comment, comment les rencontres, comment les choses se sont déroulées I had a great deal of luck getting started. I lived I was single and because I was working this job that I worked seven days a week, 11 and a half hours a day, I did not have any social life, um, did not have any life but going to work and going home. But once I decided I wanted to be a writer, I came across a very small ad in the back of a science fiction magazine mentioning a writer's workshop and mentioning the names of some of the people that were going to be there that were fairly substantial names at the time, Harlan Ellison, Damon Knight, Fritz Leiber, Frederick Pohl, and, and a few others. And I said, well, I'll never get into this, but I'll apply, because if I don't apply, I, you know, never I'll be sorry the rest of my life that I didn't at least try. So I sent in an application and much to my surprise I was accepted. And while I was there, um, not only did I meet the six or seven well-known authors who were instructors there and get a lot of encouragement from them because they seemed to see something worthwhile in my efforts, I also met a number of um, editors and other people for, who came to the workshop from New York City to explain how the publishing business worked. And those people 
looked at my stuff that I was doing there, and one suggested that if I took a story that I had and expanded it into a novel, that he would show it to his boss. Well, I was excited. I did that. Um, he showed it to his boss. She called me on the phone and told me if I would rewrite it a certain way, she would buy it. And so, in December of 1972, my first uh, published science fiction novel, titled The Heirs of Babylon, appeared from Signet Books. And then I had a great deal of adventures with uh, the next book, which was entitled Chat of All Night Falling. I wrote it, I submitted it. Um, I forget which publisher it was right now, but they accepted it. Oh, it was Lancer Books. They accepted it and promptly went into bankruptcy and returned all the properties. So I submitted it again and it was accepted by a company called Dell Books, who promptly had a major fire in their production facility and ceased publication of all stuff except their absolute bestseller items because they could get those done under contract by another printer. So it was returned to me again. In 1979, I finally had it, saw it published uh, by Berkeley Books, where it received a great deal of critical acclaim and nobody bought it, which has been a problem with a lot of my books over the years. Critics like them, it's, they're completely different, they say, from much else that was being published in English at the time, and very few people buy them at the retail level. However, as time's gone, time has gone by, almost all of my stuff has remained in print, so even though it doesn't sell a lot on any given day, it sells a lot of the time. Ça ne vous a jamais découragé, c'est-à-dire que l'activité d'écrivain était plus forte que toutes ces, mes, ces mésaventures. Vous aviez envie d'écrire. Yes, uh, I am. I guess uh, compelled. Uh, I have a psychological compulsion to do it. It's entirely irrelevant to me whether the thing actually gets published. Uh, I'm happy when it does. I walk into the bookstore now with, uh, I believe, my 49th or 50th book. It just appeared in French, um, published early for this uh, downstairs. And I walk in there and look at that with the same amount of excitement that I did at the first, the very first one. Um, very thrilled every time somebody is. Uh, foolish enough to buy one of my books and invest money in publishing it, I just, I just am thrilled right down to my toenails. I lost my point. <laughs> <laughs> vous, vous, vous nous racontiez que vous lisiez de la science-fiction et de la fantasy, et quand vous êtes mis à écrire, c'était déjà de la science-fiction et de la fantasy. Est-ce que ça s'est fait normal, ou est-ce que euh, le genre vous a donné une liberté supplémentaire par rapport à du polar ou du roman historique. Pourquoi est-ce que vous avez plutôt choisi euh, ces genres science-fiction et fantasy? I think I chose it at first because it was what I knew best. It was what I was reading most and there were things out there that I really wanted to write stuff like. I mean, almost writer, almost all writers seem to start out trying to write the same thing as their favorite authors. So the first few things I wrote were very heavily influenced by Jack Vance, by Fritz Leiber, and by somewhat obs obscure English writer named Edison. Had a couple of initials in front, but I'm not really sure what they were now. But he was, he was a difficult read because he assumed that you had an English public school education and so he would break out into classical Greek or Latin or whatever and just assume you knew what he was 
what he was talking about because you had the same education as him. And part of the challenge with him, besides the ornate language which I love, was uh, looking up sources and whatnot, trying to find out what he was saying to me in Greek or so forth. So yes, I started out very much trying to imitate people and very little of that material ever got published until I began to find, I guess, my own voice. And I think that's pretty much true for most writers. Um, unless they are born with their own voice very strongly, they start out trying to be just like someone else. Parlons un petit peu de, de la Compagnie Noire, euh, un de vos cycles le plus connu, c'est les plus connus, si ce n'est le plus connu. Euh, quelle était un petit peu l'idée d'origine Comment vous avez imaginé cette histoire au départ When I first started, I was going to write one book told from the viewpoint of the ordinary soldiers who worked for somebody like Sauron of Mordor. What was their everyday life like? Uh, what did they think of, of their boss? I mean, you're a private soldier working for the great evil of the world. Do you even think about that? Do you even care about it? Um, and that was, that was my starting point, and I tried to write about men who were rather like the routiers that the English left in France here, I don't know, it's called the Hundred Years War over on, on the English or English language side, I don't know what it's called in France, but it's a 123 years long or something like that, and terminated shortly after Joan of Arc showed up. I tried to write about, I was trying to write about people who were rather like those people who were abandoned and had to make a life the only way they knew how, which was kill people and burn things. Um, I submitted the book and it was for reasons I've never understood, not given to the fantasy editor at the publisher, but the horror editor. And although she was the horror editor, she thought it was too dark and too bleak, and she didn't like any of the characters. And so she rejected it. But then I got a phone call from her about four weeks later saying, I can't get these people out of my head. I can't get this story out of my head. Uh, I'm going to change my mind. I'm going to publish this, but you have to get together with me somewhere and we'll talk about what changes need to be made. Well, as it happened, there was a World Fantasy Convention not far from where I lived coming up shortly and she was going to be there. Um, her husband is the man who later became known as Robert Jordan, although he was not Robert Jordan at the time. Um, so we met there and got drunk and got rowdy and talked and talked and talked for hours and hours and hours and uh, decided that I could write the kind of characters I wanted in the kind of situations I wanted if I could uh, produce a trilogy and a long story arc that would make them make my people actually rather heroic, even though they were not heroic characters. That they did have that aspect to their being that they could see light and darkness and good and evil and whatnot. And in very small ways, do the right thing or do good things, even though they were in service to something not so good. So we agreed to do that. I wrote the, the three books and by the time I finished the third book I knew what the whole fourth book was going to be. The fourth book became so long that it got split into two books and then by then I knew the, the fifth and the sixth books. 
And the six books suddenly grew up until it was four very fat books, which uh, overall are under the story arc glittering stone. Then at that point I stopped doing the books. I had pretty well used up everything I had in mind. But at this point I have two more that I'm going to do. Uh, one of them is already <coughs> partially written and pieces of it have appeared in uh, American anthologies, the first two chapters. Uh, it has separate stories. And its title will be Port of Shadows. Um, and it will occur between the first and second books of The Black Company, which are separated by five years in time. It will be right in the middle of time between those two. And the last will be A Pitiless Rain. I don't know if that will even translate. Um, and it will be set after the last book that has been published so far and will involve the children and whatnot and the god Croker. Est-ce que, euh, quel regard vous portez sur, euh, sur cette série qui, qui vous a accompagné pendant euh, de nombreuses années Est-ce que c'est votre série la plus marquante En même je pense que Garrett est aussi euh, très important. Comment est-ce que vous, vous voyez euh, cette série de la Compagnie Noire Je ne pense pas que c'est particulièrement striking ou quelque chose. C'est juste de prendre plus d'histoires de ces personnages particuliers. I know as well as anyone I know in my family or anything. There's people that I... Many of them, in fact, uh, in the early books are, are based upon people that I served in, served with in the military and have their attitudes towards life and talk the way they do and behave the way they would have if they were in such dire circumstances, or at least the way I believe they would have. Um, it's not the compulsion the compulsion that I have to continue it is simply to continue um, being with my characters with my people it's the only way I can be with them is, is to be their God so to speak and and try to move them around the chessboard which they always refuse to do the way I want to do because they are real enough people that they do things the way they want to do them, oh man. We have, we have fights, me and my imaginary people, we have fights about whether we're going to do things and how we're going to do things. Est-ce que parfois ils ont fait des choses que vous n'aviez pas envie qu'ils fassent ou euh, ils vous ont surpris eux-mêmes? Oh yes, very much so. Um, actually more so in uh, my Garrett series than uh, in the Black Company because the, the, in the Garrett series there are a lot of characters that I don't know as well as I do the characters in the Black Company and while working with the Black Company people I know them well enough to know before I ever try to often anyway try to force them into a wrong role that that they won't go there, so I don't do it in the first place. With the, in the Garrett series, very often I will get big surprises from, from characters because um, I think I can make them do something that might be amusing or something, and they say, no way, that's not funny. <laughs> You're not going to do that to me. Parlez-nous justement de, de, de Garrett, comment, même, même question un petit peu, comment est née euh, cette idée de cette série avec euh, ce détective et puis euh, son ami euh, l'elfe Une série de polars et avec du fantastique dedans pour ceux qui ne connaissent pas. C'est correct. Um, it's basically what's called the American Private Eye novel, but set in a setting where you have all the, the claptrap of, of uh, cutesy fantasy and whatnot underfoot, you have, or 
elves and dwarves and vampires and zombies and everything else, they're there and all is in the way. It's kind of, bears some resemblance to Hank Mordpork in the Discworld, um, except that I actually, I, you know, there's no cross influence that I know of. I started writing the Garrett's before I ever ran into Terry Pratchett. Um, it started, the, the initial book, Sweet Silver Blues, was written as a straight detective novel uh, about 1980. And my agent said, I can sell this, but you won't get very much money for it because at that time there was not much of that sort of fiction being published. He says, uh, I'd just as soon not get you debranded and get you into a, an area where you're not well known. And so I put it aside and then about two years later suddenly realized that I could set this in a fantasy setting and have a great deal of fun with it and I, because of my compulsion to do certain things and writing and whatnot, I could not, once I thought that, not do it. So I got the book out and I plugged in some vampires and, and what not. Uh, got some real surprises. I had my character just freshly getting beaten up by some bad guys and completely out of the blue told me it's time to go see the dead man. Well, I had no idea who the dead man was until my character actually said it's time to go see him. Then I had to figure out who he was. And he's been a, a critical key character throughout the 13 or 14 books now. He's a, a character who is literally dead. He's been dead for 450 years, but he won't quit. He uh, stays in his body and uh, communicates telepathically and, and is kind of a supercomputer for Garrett. Garrett reports to him and gets people to report to him. And uh, the dead man has multiple minds that uh, he uses to process the information and find connections that are not obvious to normal people. A lot of the, the books are pretty silly. Um, and early on, a lot of them are pastiches of some of my own favorite detective writers. Um, one of them is a kind of Lovecraftian pastiche. I mean, all the Lovecraftian gods are running around of the Tumper causing civil distress and whatnot. And this Garrett ends up being the one who has to solve the problem. Is that pretty well? On, on a l'impression à vous écouter, à vous lire, ce sont des romans à la fois parfois un peu durs, mais surtout il y a une bonne dose du mot noir. Il y a certains auteurs pour qui l'écriture est, est difficile, mais à, à vous entendre, on a vraiment l'impression que c'est un plaisir et c'est un amusement. C'est vraiment ça Oh yeah, that's that's a big, big, big part of the fun that I'm having. I, I don't see my work as dark. That's a, something that people say that it is, that tell me that it is, but I think it's just uh, um, ordinary, everyday life sort of stuff, if you happen to be in that situation, of course. I mean, none of us, none of us are in a situation where the only way we can make a living is to bust things and break people's bones and whatnot, so. Uh, but no, I, yeah, I'm trying to find the right way to say, I, just that I don't, I don't think that this stuff is dark, but uh, I can't think of anybody that I would, I, off the top of my head that I would consider I would consider dark, so I think to provide an example of the difference, but no, I'm just having fun and when I plug in humor and gallows humor and stuff, it's just 
a lot of it is this, the same thing I saw when I was in the military and um, the way that uh, other military people have reported to me that um, stuff that they have seen. My work, especially the Black Company, is extremely popular with uh, American servicemen. And uh, I get a lot of feedback. Almost everybody I meet that has served in Iraq or Afghanistan read my books while they were there and have anecdotes that they want to give me that maybe I can use someday that uh, they think are absolutely hilarious gallows humor kind of things that happen in their experience and so I I am building up quite a library of really bizarre incidents that I will be able to use at some point or other. Alors, justement, comment est-ce que vous travaillez est-ce que on voit que vous servez aussi des anecdotes euh, qu'on vous raconte, mais est-ce que parfois, quand je crois que vous lisez beaucoup, euh, euh, notamment euh, vous êtes passionné d'histoire, est-ce que parfois vous dites euh, « Tiens, il y a cet élément-là, il irait bien dans cette histoire-là » ou « Tiens, cet élément-là, ça ferait un bon début de scénario. » Ah, je fais ça tout le temps. La série que je produis maintenant, « Les instrumentalités de la nuit », reflects a lot of incidents uh, from uh, medieval history, not in any one-for-one -one, uh, comparison or anything, you know, not like taking a particular battle and just replaying it, but taking uh, maybe a, an incident from a campaign that I find particularly intriguing. Um, for instance, uh, Third Crusade, all of the great kings of Europe were going to the Holy Lands to liberate the Holy Lands. And there was no way that, that the Muslims could have survived this if they all got there because there were literally hundreds of thousands of Christians going there to liberate the Holy Land. Well, eventually, uh, only the kings of England and France actually made it. And the king of France got mad at the king of England and went home. And the emperor, the Holy Roman Emperor, coming with something like 120,000 men, coming overland through Turkey, fell off his horse and drowned. So those 120,000 men, almost all of them, just turned around and went home. So that was a severe advantage to the, the, the local peoples since they only had to deal with uh, Richard, or not, yeah, Richard the Lionheart, rather than the entire male population of Europe. Je crois qu'il y a une bataille aussi à, à Poitiers qui vous a particulièrement intéressé. Yes, yes, that one's shown up in a couple of different books. So, uh, several of the battles, actually, of the, the Hundred Years' War. Um, Cresse, I don't know how to pronounce that properly, but yeah, Agincourt. Um, several of the, the battles where the English came out very well, even though they lost the war, um, have turned up, at least in some part in several of my series. I think I've used most of the significant battles of the Hundred Years' War in the uh, Dread Empire series at some point or other. Uh, that's not available in French, so I, or at least I don't think that it is. Um, I'm not aware of it if it is. Um, and in in some other books, uh, I have used a lot of incident. Never, as I say, though, it's never one-on-one. -on -one. It's not line up the, the guys on each side and just change the names of the kings and, and have the same things happen. Et pourquoi pas particulièrement cette, cette guerre de, de son temps Parce qu'elle a été euh, 
particulièrement longue, avec beaucoup de rebondissements, ou c'est dû à la, à la période Well, the Hundred Years' War was, was not a continuous war. There be, uh, it's, I think it's probably considered one war because it was, even though it lasted over a century, it was always about the same thing, about who was going to be the King of France. And the King of England seemed to think that he had the job and that the guy in France was a pretender and the guy in France seemed to think that uh, King of England had no real claim on it. However, he was related and however the properties have been handed down and whatnot from generation to generation. And it's just really fascinating to watch the tides swirl this way and swirl that way and the whole thing being influenced a great deal by stuff outside the actual conflict. The politics of the time, who's pushing who to do what, um, just how much money one king or the other could raise in order to finance a campaign often influenced the way the, the, the tides of war went. The French king almost always had the advantage monetarily, but usually if they met the English in a, in a set piece battle, it always came off badly for the French. And often there's no, no figuring out why, except that some particular duke or baron or whatever would decide that uh, this is a good time not to show up or this is a good time to make my point, you know, by not participating. I'll just sit here and watch while you get your butt kicked. Um, so the whole thing is, you know, it's, it's history pretty much the way it is throughout the world, but it's history that's very much more accessible to me as, as a person of European descent, of, of English descent and whatnot. I can, understand it probably better than, than similar things in, in China or India. Uh, the same things happen, the same kind of problems are dealt with, but uh, it's a little bit more understandable. Quand on, on lit votre biographie, il y a des périodes où euh, sont publiés quasiment trois romans euh, par an, quasiment. Aujourd'hui, euh, il y en a un petit peu moins. Est-ce que euh, ça veut dire que votre manière de travailler a changé ou que c'est plus compliqué aujourd'hui ou plus long pour vous décrire un livre Il y a quelques choses qui ont Durant les années 1980s, oui, j'ai eu trois livres par an. C'était parce que, comme je l'ai mentionné beaucoup plus tard, que j'ai écrit tout le temps dans les 1970s et que je n'ai pas publié rien. And <coughs> all of the stuff that I wrote during the 1970s at the rate of about, about every six or eight months um, was getting published during the 1980s. There was a, a month, May I believe it is, of 1985 when I had three books come out from three different publishers, none of which were written in the 1980s. All of them had been written in the 1970s. Um, also, the books in those days were compelled to be shorter. You could only write, it was, it was partly a mechanical thing. The presses used by the printing, printers could only publish, or could only print books that were so thick. There was a limit on the thickness and whatnot of a book, so you were limited at the length that you could write. Further these days, we writers work on computers instead of a uh, typewriter. When you work on a typewriter and you have to retype every draft, um, you tend to be much more of a spare writer the first time through and try to get it right because you don't want to take a couple months to type it up again in a clean copy. With a computer, you can just kind of loaf and let it go as long as you want. And 
for me, even though I, I generally cut out probably 40% of what I write before I turn in a manuscript. The books now are twice as long as they were back in the day, simply because it's easier to, to do that. Um, I noticed that a number of my books, they, when they're published in French, they split them into two because the English version is so long. Uh, I'm, I'm amongst the people who write the shorter books now in American fantasy, so uh, there may be people you'll never see here, like Stephen Erickson, whose books are like that thick, and there's ten volumes that thick in his series. <laughs> Il nous reste un, un petit quart d'heure. Est-ce que quelqu'un a une question à poser à Glen Cook ou est-ce qu'on continue euh, cette interview Allez-y, n'hésitez pas, c'est le bon moment. Question quoi Oui, monsieur, là-bas. Euh, J'aimerais savoir si, euh, notamment la Compagnie Noire, c'est le fait que le Trône de Fer soit sorti en série maintenant. Est-ce que ça pourrait être une possibilité pour la Compagnie Noire ou est-ce que ça ne vous intéresse pas enfin, Qu'est-ce que vous en pensez quoi If I understand the question, is it, will there be a cinema version of Black Company uh, My agent is in negotiation right now with uh, and this means absolutely nothing because we've been in, a, in negotiations with somebody about something of my writing continuously with Hollywood over years and years and nothing ever comes of it. But we're in negotiation right now with uh, one of the producers who was involved in the Indiana Jones and the um, prequel trilogy of Star Wars to, to do a black company. And it, thing but they haven't decided whether they want to do it as a feature film series or as a television series like the game of thrones whether it, as i say whether anything will come of that your guess is probably better than mine does that answer your question good is que quelqu'un a une autre question à poser à Glenn Cook? Alors simplement, on, on va continuer, il y a un certain nombre de séries qu'on ne connaît pas encore euh, en France. Est-ce que vous pourriez nous dire un petit mot, notamment de, de Dread Empire et de Starfisher qu que ça, de, de quoi parlent ces séries The Dread Empire is a fantasy series. It was originally conceived to be 14 volumes, three of which would be, consist of short stories. It's actually conceived of as being one extremely long novel involving um, certain key characters and their entire lifetime from the time that they are young men forced to flee. Each, each one comes from a totally different culture, but circumstances force them to, to flee their home. And they meet and become friends and Two of the three grow up to become kings, and the other one dies young. It's a very, very complex history of a world where magic, magic works, of course. I mean, it's fantasy, so... Um, it's almost... In, It's very difficult for me to explain beyond that level, except that it's a world that, in addition to the characters who are interacting in the empires and nations and tribes and kingdoms that are in conflict and, and swirling conflict, sides changing, alliances shifting and whatnot. There is an over character variously called the star writer or the director or whatnot who's stirring it all up 
and he's doing it for reasons that are intentionally obscure, but if you pay attention, um, you will eventually figure it out. Part of the, this is a critically very well received sort of thing, but it was not commercially popular because it required the reader to do so much work, so much of the work. Uh, you, if you didn't even, I mean, if you failed to read the chapter heading, the chapter title, and did not internalize it, you would get lost. Every single little point and incident and whatnot in the Good Empire series as originally conceived was important. Even the names of the characters, you had to go, if you really wanted to know something more about them, you had to go to Old English or Old French or something or other and find out what that word meant in the year 800 or thereabouts. So those, those have just been bought, brought back into print in English by a company called Nightshade Books. And seven of them were published. Nightshade is published now one of the story collections. And in January, they will re be publishing a novel, A Path to Coldness of Heart, which basically wraps up the series at uh, eight volumes rather than the projected amount. It's got the incidents and whatnot from the from the what would have been the next four books compressed into one. Part of the problem with that was, I guess tell an anecdote. When I first began to be published regularly, um, I got invited to a lot of um, science fiction fantasy fan things in my part of the world. My wife and I started having annual parties at our house for friends that we'd made by attending those events. And they got quite huge. It got to be 120, 150 people come to the house for the weekend. Um, and one year, the last year that we had it, someone got into my private files. They stole some of the key books, almost 35 or 40 key books out of my book collection disappeared, including some rather rare ones. The only copy that I had of, of a porno novel that I wrote, which was the first thing that I ever got paid for, um, disappeared. And all the developmental material for the next book of the Dread Empire, except for one carbon copy of page 143 of the next book, was stolen. Now, how people got all this stuff out of my house without anyone notice, I have no idea. But when I came back to the Dread Empire 20 years after the fact, or 15 years, however long it was, to write the book for Nightshade that would wrap it up, I had nothing but my memories to go on because all of the material that went with it had been stolen by someone who really wanted to know what was going to happen next. End of an anecdote. Il y a votre carrière a commencé, on l'a dit, il y, a, il y a 30 ans. Quel regard portez-vous euh, dessus sur ces 30 ans Est-ce que euh, le jeune homme qui euh, a publié une première fois en 1970 a eu la vie qu'il voulait Yeah, I've had, a, I've had a good life. I'm, I've been very lucky throughout my life. Uh, I'm happy. I'm, I'm, I'm a small fish in a, or a medium-sized fish in a small pond at home. Um, my books sell, after, after 30 years, 35 years, my books began to sell well enough so that uh, um, I can actually do it for a living. Uh, most of my life I worked for General Motors in various capacities, 
until I was offered an opportunity to take an early retirement during, during the middle of the 1990s. Um, I've not been hugely famous or hugely commercially successful like a Stephen King or anything, but I'm totally happy with my life. I've got a wonderful wife that I've had for ever. Um, absolutely wonderful woman. Give you the shirt off her back. And, and I have three marvelous sons, uh, all of whom have advanced the bloodline dr dramatically. I mean, nobody in my time or before me ever went to, ever graduated from college, but all three of mine are not only college graduates, but masters, and uh, the oldest one is a major in the United States Army. Uh, the second one is a, an architect who works on um, sports stadiums and hospitals and that sort of thing. And my youngest one is a symphony musician and plays flute in uh, symphonic orchestras. On attend la salut pour une dernière question, monsieur là-bas. Oui, monsieur là-bas qui levait la main, s'il faut relever la main. Bonjour, euh, j'ai remarqué au fil des lectures de vos livres que de nombreux personnages assez euh, de premier plan euh, mouraient au fil des aventures et je voulais savoir s'il y avait une, une volonté euh, derrière ça, par exemple d'afficher un collectif ou euh, de montrer les enjeux des puissances plutôt que des personnages ou la volonté de de justement ne pas rentrer dans les codes du héros euh, classique euh, qui euh, vint toujours à la fin, etc. Merci. Pretty much true, yes. Uh, the hero or the protagonist, whatever, of the Black Company series is the company. It's not the people who are in it. There are people who go on, last through number of books, Sometimes they die and sometimes they come back to life. Uh, there are, Croker is a central character throughout the series, always was, always will be. He will appear in the books yet to come. But he is not, he is not the protagonist per se. It, the whole thing is about the company and the idea of the company, the thing that uh, is bigger than the sum of its parts. If that answers your question. Il y avait une autre question devant, pour monsieur. Bonjour, euh, excusez-moi. À travers la, la Compagnie Noire, enfin, c'est un univers médiéval fantastique, euh, enfin, très prononcé sur le médiéval, et puis il y a un moment, il y a un, il y a un intermède, si on va dire, sur la peine de la peur, qui, qui tient plus du merveilleux, avec euh, des pierres qui parlent, euh, des baleines qui volent. Euh, Qu'est-ce que c'est que ces, cette peine de la peur C'est une fantaisie au milieu de la fantaisie Oui, c'est vrai. Une partie de ce que j'ai fait, when I made that deal to, to uh, create an initial trilogy according to the, that editor's uh, blueprint was to cannibalize a big part of a book that I had partially written and given up on. And all of the stuff that happens not all of the stuff, but most of the stuff that happens in that desert with the walking, talking stones and the wind whales and, and old father tree and so on was all cannibalized from a, another book that, that I had given up on. Now, it's writer laziness, but uh, it also, I thought it worked quite well and it eliminated certain characters and whatnot, brought certain interesting characters to life, like Toad Killer Dog. <clears throat> so, 
Yep, you know, I, even, even with the black company, I have some fun making stuff up and being as weird as I can. Allez, on, on prend une dernière peut-être question, est-ce qu'il y en a une Oui, madame, là-bas. Puis après, on va laisser la place à, à la conférence qui suit. Allez, là-bas. Bonjour. Euh, en fait, au fil du temps, euh, le chroniqueur change et euh, le ton change, mais la manière, peut-être les détails auxquels ils vont s'intéresser, change. Comment vous, vous avez appréhendé le fait de vous profiler dans une personnalité différente en, en fonction des, des chroniqueurs Analyste. Uh, that's correct. That's deliberate, intentionally done. I wanted to show that um, History is all, all, almost never actually what's written down. When you change analysts, you see that not only is the tone different, but each new analyst generally tends to report where the previous analysts lied to you and made themselves look better and, and so on, which is what, what people do. I, it was, uh, It was all deliberate, and then how I got into the personalities enough to make it obvious that the changes were different and whatnot, I'm not absolutely sure. I guess that if I have a talent or a genius or something, whether maybe that was it. On va remercier Glenn Cook parce que l'heure est passée vite, mais elle est désormais terminée. Vous allez pouvoir le retrouver en dédicace et puis si vous restez ici il y a une conférence quand l'image de la science conduit à la science-fiction merci à vous et merci à Glenn Collier.